Good morning. Welcome to Forum. I'm Judy M. Files. I'm one of the four facilitators. We also have Kathy Heaters, Barbara Bynum, and Phoebe Benziger. Anytime any of you have suggestions for programs, things you'd like to hear, please let one of the four of us know. We like to accommodate what the community wants. This morning, obviously we're going to be talking about school safety. You evidently knew that because you got our email. If you're not on our email list, where you get those invitations that give you an idea of what's coming up the, the next Wednesday, please let us know. We'll give you a card, tells you how to connect with us. Okay, this morning, I am going to very quickly introduce to you Jim Pavlich, <laughs> Commander Matt Smith, and Ed Hayden. And they're going to tell you everything else they want you to know. All right, well, thanks for coming today. I'm the Executive Director of Operations for the School District, and Ed Higgins is the Senior, Senior Director of Community Operations. Senior Director of Community Operations for Access Health Systems. So we typically present on school safety as a group because I think what's unique about what Montrose is doing is as a community, we're approaching um, school safety as kind of, a, uh, well, not kind of as a community task. All right, and so we're gonna spend about the next 35, 40 minutes kind of walking you through um, kind of three big areas related to school safety. And then we hope to have a good, uh, at least 15 or 20 minutes at the end for questions. Uh, we brought some of our principals here. So if you have questions about actual the school level, you can talk to them. And then, um, you know, I think the three of us can speak more broadly. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's go. Okay, so I like the wagon wheel metaphor, you know, for, for what we do. You know, we have kind of uh, three big areas that I like to think about when we're talking about school safety. Our protection efforts, our prevention efforts, and then this culture of vigilance, right? Um, and we're gonna kind of end with that today. But when you think about it, it's probably, my perception of culture of vigilance is a little different than what your brain's probably going to right away. Um, and so, like protection, I want you to think about protection as kind of the, the, the steel around the edge of the wagon wheel. It's really important, it gives us, makes us resilient, it makes this last over time. I want you to think of the prevention efforts as the hub or the center of gravity. One thing, that if you take it away, the, the wheel will collapse, okay? And then I want you to think of the culture of vigilance as, as the spokes on this wheel. All right, so let's go. All right, we're gonna start off here um, on kind of our protection efforts. There's a lot on this slide. We don't wanna have six slides, so bear with me. We're gonna walk through it. Matt, uh, Mayor Smith, you wanna start out? Surely, so foundational to school safety is obviously the strong partnership between the school district and the law enforcement community with the school resource officer program. So without that, without officers and deputies in our schools creating good relationships with students, parents, and administration, I think it fails. So it'd be remiss for me not to mention the fact that that is foundational to keeping kids safe and to providing psychological safety to the groups that I just mentioned. Secondary to that, we had three school resource officers within the city of Montrose. We have one more allotted for the 2A funding initiative that's yet to be filled based on staffing considerations. And the Sheriff's Office, who have, we have representation from here today, also has one deputy in their school district, or their school system as well. So we have our school resource officers trained for Alice, so that they can also train school district officials and administration in how to react in a dynamic or a violent situation. So internally what we do as law enforcement is we also practice for the worst case scenario. So we do tabletops, we do rapid emergency deployment training with our staff so that if the worst case scenario does unfold, we're prepared for it. And we also have joint and tactical emergency management systems that we have in place to keep people safe in those dynamic situations. So over, um, I think the last time I gave a big community presentation on safety, we, we were pursuing grant funding. Uh, we were pursuing grant funding for communication, um, and we were pursuing grant funding to improve our access control and video management in schools. And so that's that first thing. It's about, over the last uh, three and a half years, we have 
uh, been able to uh, secure funding for about seven million dollars of security upgrades in the Montrose County School District. That is centered around kind of three big things. One, access control, which means our ability to monitor the state of our doors in the building. You know, it lets us um, lock and unlock doors from a software interface. I can do it from my cell phone. Um, it also allows uh, for us to have monitor doors. So like if we if the door's propped open, we're gonna see it at the school. Okay? Uh, the second thing it does is we replaced all of our cameras. We were originally using a hike vision system, which made a lot of news in the past two and a half years. Uh, as a Chinese very the fed says you can't use it anymore. Um, and we upgraded to an American company Axis uh, camera systems. That integrates with our access control system, which is Genetech, um, one of like three big systems that uh, enterprise level organizations use. And then uh, the last thing there, I've got, it says door locks and vestibules. So we seek to create a place to contain visitors when they come into our buildings. All of our campuses are fenced, all of our elementary campuses, play areas are fenced, and we try to create <coughs> essentially two entrances at all of our schools. One, the main entrance, and then most of our schools have a bus entrance as well, where kids will offload at a different location and come in. Um, we, at each of those main entrances, we've created vestibules, which basically is a, a little fishbowl or a holding area where we can run our visitors through the Raptor system, which you see up there, which basically does a, 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 a knack. A, a, a local check to see if people are, like you run their license, they get a sticker that says who they are um, in the building so we know that they're supposed to be there and we also know that they haven't been convicted of any crimes against children. So it's a basic search that we do with the Raptor. Uh, and that is made possible by those vestibules. <clears throat> Next thing is we want a grant for the Motorola School Safe Communication System. So I wear a radio. Our principals over there, they've all got a different, they got UHF radios, I have an 800 megahertz radio, which is the same radios as uh, public safety carries. And what the school safe system does is it allows us in emergency situations to speak directly to responding agencies, whether it be fire or police, okay? It also allows us to speak across the greater district with each other in emergency situations. So a school can bridge and talk to me at district office even though it's in Olathe. And um, then dispatch has the ability to uh, talk to the school directly in an emergency situation. Yesterday dispatch did their weekly radio checks with us and our schools talk to them every week uh, um, when things are going on. So not only do we have the ability to call 911, but we also have um, the ability to talk to them with radio. I love radio um, uh, because when I talk on the radio, everybody who's on that frequency gets immediate situational awareness. Um, so uh, we went with that a few years back. The other thing I think is important to understand about this Genetech system is every school that has it installed, we're, we're completing phase three, so uh, three more schools are coming online this year, has a lockdown button. If they hit that lockdown button, it overrides their normal schedule. It locks all the exterior doors, and the only ones that can get in are law enforcement. It also dials 911 right away, and so you're taking out some of these human decisions that have to be made. Because we find in emergency situations a lot, um, I'm a principal in the building, I'm managing my folks, and maybe we don't call 911 in that first instant, but we lock down our school in that first instant. So if we hit that button, we get 911 on the call because we're very lucky in this county uh, with law enforcement, that they're generally going to be, you know, on scene way before three minutes um, for most of our schools. Okay. Uh, last thing, I think people talk about this a lot. We have an armed response in our schools, <coughs> thanks to our partnership with law enforcement. You know, Sheriff Willard and Chief Hall, they they have prioritized SROs in our schools, and they're organized in feeder systems. So, like the Olathe schools and Oak Grove are managed by the. Um, I think she's here. Where is she? Yeah, Eddie right. Jarrell, W. Jarrell over there. And then um, our the Montrose Police Department takes down the Centennial feeder, the Columbine feeder, and we have one SRO all the time at, uh, at Montrose High School. 
because of the size of the school. Um, I'm talking a lot on this. This is probably the longest we'll spend on any slide. I apologize. Standard response protocol is what we use. It's a uh, vape. It was created up in Bailey after the Platte Canyon High School deal. And it's basically four steps that uh, common safety measures that we use. And then we use Alice for our lockdown protocol. And I threw up, you know, all their, their swag up there. If you want to research those things, you can do so. But Alice basically tells you uh, it empowers all of our staff to make their decisions for their safety and the safety of the kids they're responsible for uh, based on their situation in the school. So if I need to evacuate my kids, I'm empowered to do so. Um, I'm also taught how to respond if a, um, an individual were to breach into my room. I want to say this, though. Um, you know, this is outstanding. We have a number of things scheduled this fall with the police department and the sheriff's office and the fire department to practice what we would do in, a, in situations. But this right here is probably the bullet most of just glazed right over that's the most important one on there. We changed out all of our doors to make sure they have push button locks in our classrooms. And in, in school shootings, a, a shooter has never breached a locked door. Okay, so probably one of the most important things we did on there was made it so um, our teachers don't have to leave the room like they did down in Uvalde. They don't have to leave the room to lock their door. They just push the button. Okay, and uh, they don't breach because they're on the clock. You know, they got about three minutes to get everything done. Um, so, um, the school level, basically they're doing drills, they're checking in their, their visitors, and then that last bullet we're going to circle back to, but we're really emphasizing with the strategic plan, you know, a relationship focus in our schools. Okay, so let's talk about the hub. We're gonna start with the video. I think I gotta go over here to get this going. Safety is always our most important priority and we will do everything we can to keep the students and staff of our school district safe. We now have a prevention-based threat assessment model that will support students in crisis. If you have a concern, report it. We will take care of that kid and that family and we will keep our community safe. Threat assessment teams are endorsed by the National Council um, for Behavioral Health as the best prevention for mass violence as a parent. I know that my kids are in a school district where their safety is being considered and taken seriously, um, and as a community, we're coming together to support them. So I'm Officer Travis Booth, and I've been a school resource officer for going on 13 years. So the threat assessment has always been in, a, in effect since I've been in SRO. Sometime last year, um, Jim Pat started searching into uh, Salem Kaiser program. It's a threat assessment program that's known nationwide. We brought in the John Van Driel and Alan Warren Rainwater, two of the authors of the book, uh, The Salem Kaiser Threat Assessment Model, to train our community in how to do this Salem Kaiser threat assessment process. Essentially, last year I was new to this job. Chief Hall took over the Montrose Police Department and Sheriff Miller took over the Sheriff's Department. So we were all talking about uh, threat assessment because uh, during our grounding, our trainings for the new positions, we got to interact with the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit. We asked them what they thought was a good model for community threat assessment, and they mentioned the Salem-Kaiser model. They said Salem, Oregon is doing it right, and they've been doing it right for about 20 years. The threat assessment process that we've chosen is one that is community-based, um, that is a prevention model, um, that is very forward-focused. If we are looking for an avenue to best protect our youth, our community, our kids, and ensure that our youth in our community who are struggling, who are making threats, are cared for, then this model is one that, um, at the center, we believe is going to be successful. Our most important job is making sure your kids come back to you at night, and we are committed to doing that right. We want families to know that our community is working together to meet the needs of all children and that some challenges should not be faced alone. Okay. 
Okay, I just want to say um, how, for me, you know, that video kind of does an overview of the meeting that Chief Hall invited uh, me and, and Sheriff Lillard and Amanda Jones from the, the Center for Mental Health, which is now Access Health Systems, to uh, where we got to interact with the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. And I, I'm just so appreciative to uh, all three agencies for partnering with the school district from the very beginning. Um, you know, after that call, I said, you know, I'll buy the book and read it. If it's good, will you guys send folks with me? And they both said, for sure. Uh, all three organizations said, for sure. And so we cruised up to Salem and tried to kind of figure out if their system would help us address some of these issues. So pre before the system, you know, we had, um, you know, when, you, when a kid makes a threat, you gotta figure out what to do with the kid. You know, they, they've, uh, I don't know how to say it, sinned against the, the community of learners they're in. And there's got to be some restorative component. And then you got to make sure that they're not um, a danger to the other kids. And so we would have expelled them. You know, I, that, you know, right after Parkland, I think I personally and, and I pushed through, I don't know, 15 expulsions, you know, because kids were just processing that trauma poorly and posting things online. And like, we couldn't figure out how to, you know, whether or not they were truly a threat. Um, so we had high expulsion numbers. We, I remember the first time I reached out to the center uh, was in February of 2018. I'm like, hey, I need to know if this kid's safe to go to school. And, uh, and the center was like, uh, what? You know? I'm like, well, you know, you guys are head folks. Like, talk to him and tell me, you know, if he should be okay to come into school. And in about a 30 minute conversation, I uh, was let, I was uh, schooled on, look, we're gonna see if they'll respond to treatment, you know, if they come in. You know, we're not gonna tell you, you know, we can't do like a, they're safe type, type thing. That's a forensic psychologist. And, you know, even they're not gonna guarantee the kids not gonna do something. <clears throat> I reached out to law enforcement in that, that spring and was like, hey, you know, Matt, this kid made a threat. And then, you know, it's like, okay, <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't charge them. You know, they don't meet the criteria for a charge. Or, you know, I can give them an interference with the school facility or what have you. Um, so we had a real hard time bringing them back as well because people were like, that kid made a threat. And why are you putting them back in the school? And then, you know, parents obviously are like, he was just, you know, this doesn't define who or he or she is. It's like, how, how can we get better? So, so Matt, do you want to speak to some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Just to kind of support what Jim's talking about, some of the challenges that we saw from law enforcement post Parkland. As he said, it's very true that our students um, and our youth did not react to that very well. It's not a surprise because that was a tragic event that affected a lot of people in a lot of ways. So it's really impossible for me to put myself in the shoes of a school-age student and see that event through their eyes. I have different set of experiences, so it's hard for me to imagine what that felt like. So, like Jim said, some of the challenges that law enforcement was presented with is that statutorily, some of the threats that were made by our students who reacted poorly were not things that fulfilled any kind of statutory element. So we couldn't charge a lot of these people, so it did create an issue, right? We expel the kids, we don't have a law enforcement component to this, we don't have a criminal uh, crowbar, so to speak to get any kind of leverage to figure out what kind of restorative justice can be brought to bear. So that was one of our big challenges pre-Salem. So when we went to Salem, what we found was that even though we had a threat assessment model, this model was much better. And it was better for one reason, and this is just my opinion, and maybe Jim and probably Ed can uh, support this or expound upon it, shared nomenclature. And when we talk about silos, one of the things that we really found after sitting down for about, for me, 30 minutes with a group was that we were talking different languages, but we were saying the same things. <laughs> we were just saying it in different ways. The dramatic impact for that can't be understated because if you're saying the same things and you all have the same goal, but you're talking in different languages, nothing really can get done. So that was one of the biggest impacts that I saw. One of the other biggest impacts, obviously, was the multi-agency collaboration. I can remember very vividly sitting around a uh, in a room at a table with about 25 people, I think it was from all kinds of different agencies, you know, Center for Mental Health, 
uh, law enforcement, courts, probation, child protective services, adult protective services, uh, attorneys, just every single group that you can imagine. And they were all talking the same language and they all had a shared common goal. And they were sharing in the liability of what this threat assessment model took on. So that was one of the things that impacted me the most, as did the prevention focus. The forward focusing mitigation of threats of harm to self or others, just that forward focused community-based uh, mindset was, was very critical and a very impactful thing for me to watch. It was interesting when we sat in that first level two, and we'll talk about the levels, but their community-based team, uh, Matt pulled out uh, one of those, uh, you know, big sheets. He just has a little fold book that he carries with him all over the place. And he just starts writing down the names in the county. He's like, this is who we get for, from this organization. Like, he was just going around the room. He's like, we can do this. Um, and I, Matt just kind of touched on it. As we were going back to the airport, I was fired up with the SROs and with uh, the commander um, about this notion of threat assessment. I'm like, this is great. And uh, the center was like, well, hey, they've got this suicide thing too. What do you think? I mean, it's the same levels. And I was like, would that make you guys more apt to come on board? And they were like, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, sure, that, that shouldn't be that hard. And that's turned out to be kind of the bigger hurdle. So I already mentioned this a little bit. From law enforcement perspective, this is a, an interesting graphic. This is very typical of what I thought issues could be solved with, uh, hammer to a nail. If we have someone who commits a crime or we have someone that needs to be charged, we do that and we don't think about it ever again. Well, threat assessment is very different from that because it's an ongoing process that's not just taken care of with one action. It has to be followed through and it has to be managed for the duration of whatever that threat looks like. I don't have a time frame for a lot of these, but it's definitely not a hammer to the nail. We don't write a ticket and the problem is solved. We don't take someone to jail and the problem goes away. Because when we talk about youth, a lot of times the reality is this, they don't go to a detention center. If they do, it's for a very brief amount of time and then they're back in our community or they're back in our school. So we have to have some kind of mechanism that allows us to manage that threat after that law enforcement action. So we already talked about the language that's common and the shared responsibility. I think one of the issues that we saw is that we were all a little bit bashful about that responsibility, right? And because of that, we maybe didn't communicate the way we should have or the way that we were able to now. So that's critical for us. These relationships that we build allow us to share that responsibility and management of a threat, all while using the same language and communicating each other communicating with each other about some pretty sensitive issues, but it's all for the greater good. Okay. Like Jim said, one of the reasons we were so excited to get on board with this was around the suicide prevention opportunity. We want to recognize Whitney Silva, our assistant, one of our assistant directors that leads uh, that team is present with us today. I also want to recognize somebody that was on the video earlier that's now the Chief Clinical Officer of the Mine Springs in Grand Jackson as far fire. I don't think um, the center or now Access Health System would be as far along in the process if it wasn't for her leadership and then ultimately also Whitney's leadership in this. So very proud to be here and kind of standing in those shoes. As you guys know, if you follow in the media or if you're following uh, any um, uh, of the data trends out there around suicide. We know that uh, the United States has seen huge increases in our youth suicide rates across the last couple of decades, and that's certainly true in our region as well. Uh, over the top, last decade plus that I've been in this community and other parts of um, our six county region, we've seen um, you know some years where we're looking at uh, double digit figures for uh, suicides with our young people, let alone when you start adding the adults into that figure as well. And so coming on board with this was a, kind of a no-brainer for us in terms of suicide prevention. When I first started at the Center for Mental Health, um, suicide was something that we spoke to as, you know, that's a public health issue. That's not, uh, that's not a behavioral health issue. It's not a mental health issue. And over the course of that, this past decade, that's one of the things that we've had an opportunity to really change our mindset from the inside is that, you know, nobody's picking up the ball with suicide prevention. Uh, you, you 
have you know Jim at the school district leading the way, and Matt and others in law enforcement that are leading the way um, within uh, how they're impacted by a suicide. But no one in the community has really taken up the ball with that. And when we have the opportunity to join with others, uh, I think that's the biggest been the biggest change for our our mindset and our culture is looking at suicide from the standpoint of what role do we play in this. Um, we're prevention experts when someone can sit in the seat with us, but we're not often the experts when it comes to what's going on with someone that doesn't come in our door. And that's the tough piece. And so the work here that I think mean, uh, Jim and the school district are doing on the prevention end of things, being able to recognize uh, what the warning signs are of suicide. We are horrible predictors of the future. But what we can do is look at every single warning sign that might be present with someone, and then we follow through on that. And I think that's the beauty um, that we're able to bring to the table with having our, our therapists embedded in the schools, case managers embedded in the schools, um, and as we move forward, is really being able to engage at that level and um, being able to, regardless of what a school teacher, a paraprofessional, whomever in the district identifies with a student and say, there's something not quite right here. What can be done? And then being able to go in, and whether that's a level one assessment or if it rises to a higher level, but we've been able to intervene early on, farther upstream than what we had been able to do beforehand. Yeah. So from us, um, there's, a, there's a lot of models out there. There's not really a lot. There's about three or four big national models with an assessment. Uh, Colorado has one of its own. Um, it's it's has a lot of similarities with the Virginia model, the Dewey Cornell uh, threat assessment model. And what I liked about this model, uh, the Salem Kaiser model, is that it was created by a, a school professional, like a K-12 school professional. A school psychologist created it, John Van Driel. Um, we've had the opportunity to interact with a lot over the last three, three or four years now. And he, instead of being focused on like a transitory threat or an immediate threat uh, to your community or your schools, he focused, he's like, that's, you're looking at the wrong ball. We need to be looking at whether we're looking at target aggression or reactive aggression. And <clears throat> because, you know, reactive aggression is less concerning. You poke me in the chest, you know, um, I'm liable to want to come back, okay? But uh, targeted predatory behavior, like a cat stalking type of a scenario, that's really what we're most concerned about when we think about safety. Um, and it ups the ante on interventions for us. So they had this school level assessment that, you know, uh, and, and this is the other big difference between this system and others. A lot of the other systems, it's all on the school. The school's encouraged to bring in community partners, but that principal is supposed to build the relationships to pull in, you know, um, the hilltop when they need them, or to be able to reach out to the Access Health System when they need them. So, like, it's it's a really high bar for for especially when we think about our elementary schools that might process five or eight of these a year. You know, uh, this system had a school level where they could do an assessment, and you saw a stool earlier, three legs. On these, there's always three people involved: a school administrator, an SRO, and somebody who represents mental health. So at the school assessment, that's a counselor um, or a social worker, and at the uh, community level, that's our community mental health provider. Um, Matt hit on it earlier, the whole notion of shared liability. Um, you know, it's not just me saying this kid's safe, it's a team of professionals in the community saying, I think we're gonna be all right with this, and, um, and this is why. It's preventative focus, and you know, it, I, I uh, you know, Matt's always hammer and nail, and I'm always like lanes. Like, it provides guardrails for uh, families and students when they enter the process. It says, hey look, this is where we want you to go. You can keep going forward as much as you want, but we're gonna keep you here until you earn the right to, to get off this road, you know? Um, so, let's go with our next one here. So we formed this, this threat assessment team, um, the Center for Mental Health at the time, uh, uh, the sheriff's department, the police department, the school district, all equally pitched in to bring out John Van Driel and train about 105 folks in our community on how to do this threat assessment process. Um, we created an MOU with all these organizations. It's like about 13 different entities 
are represented every week in a student threat assessment meeting where we can staff threats to self or threats to others. Um, and um, Matt hit on it. You know, this isn't a moment in time because today the risk might be low, but tomorrow, if there's a perceived loss, that risk could go high. Okay? And so it's an ongoing process with these kids. We basically have three big goals here, you know? Um, I don't know, Matt, you want to talk about from your perspective? <laughs> So when we talk about public safety, obviously that's our business, that's the sheriff's office business. We want to make sure that everybody is safe. That feels like a physical statement to me. I want to make sure that you are safe. But there's another component that's a little bit deeper for me, in my opinion, and that's the psychological safety, right? That's more of a thought type safety. Everybody has kids in school. Everybody knows someone who has kids in school. Everybody knows a teacher or an administrator or someone who works near or at the school. It's very important for us to make sure that in public safety, we're also helping to provide for that psychological safety. So when we send the kids off to school, as a parent, you feel safe. That kid feels safe, the administrators and the staff feel safe, and everyone's family feels safe. So this process also provides for that. Threat assessment model is not punitive in nature. It's actually really a wraparound type service that we provide, and it's engaging at the student level and at the parent level and at the school level. So that also, as strange as it may sound to say, provides for psychological safety for that child who may be at risk to make a threat to himself, herself, or others. You know, the, our goal really is the reduction of suicides and, and any violent act. One of the pieces that I think is key here is these individuals are members of our community. At the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, they're all us. And they may not be present with us today, maybe they are, but they are part of our community. And one of our goals has to be how do we retain individuals in our community, regardless of what's going through their mind? And how do we prevent a person from getting to the point that they want to commit a violent act, whether that's against themselves or against someone else? Then for, you know, the, the one I like to speak to on this slide is we want to figure out how to get kids back in school. Like, we pull them out for a year, we uh, impact their likelihood to graduate on time. Uh, we, you know, their, their academic outcomes decrease, okay? So like we wanna figure out a way to bring them back safely following a suspension, expulsion, or a psychological crisis, okay? And I think that, that top bullet there, these are, there's a symbiotic relationship between suicide risk assessment and threat assessment. You know, I think it's 89% uh, of any mass, of the mass shooters are also are experiencing suicidal ideation. You know, it's like they're tied together. You know, by 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 taking better care of our students and families, we're also making our schools safer. Can I interrupt? Yes. Yeah. Um, the other interesting statistic there is only about twenty five percent of them have a diagnosed mental illness. So as we as we get into the Q and A thing, if you're curious about that, we, we might want to field some questions around there. But to me, that's, that's a fascinating piece that not a lot of mental illness, but a great deal of suicidal ideation as part of their overall um, pre-visualizing their act. So again, we got two levels. Level one comprises school staff, that those three components in the level two is a community uh, level team. On the, on the suicide side of the house, it's a little different. We'll talk about that more as we go. All right, I think it's important to understand and you know, Matt has done a good job weaving this in the whole time. The, the student threat assessment team is an and process, okay? You know, we have, we're not, not doing discipline, you know? A kid, if they, if they do an egregious act or make an egregious threat, there's a, there's a discipline consequence to it. But that's separate from the threat assessment process, okay? That's separate from law enforcement or mental health um, interventions that may or may not occur. You know, in a threat assessment, if you share a concern about a kid, all those things are going to happen. We're going to talk to the kid. We're going to talk to the family. We're going to talk to all the kid's teachers, okay? And then we're going to go through a 20-question protocol and see if, um, you know, what we know after that. We're going to look at their CUME file, and we're going to review their discipline. So, like, every time you do it, share a concern, a community member, a student, a parent, there's a two-hour process that's going to occur to make sure we're not missing anything on that individual. And then, you know, I, I before, um, I know Matt's gonna wanna add here, but I'm like, I think it's 
It's really important to understand the limitations of our systems, and that's one of the things this has done. Like I can get crest the threshold for a charge, but 90% of the time that kid's gonna be back in the home with it, even with the most severe charge <laughs> within 72 hours, you know? So that's not a solution. I, I can expel the kid, but if I kick him out of school, you know, or her out of school, and even if I kick them out for a year, they're still in our community, walking around, but now I don't have any eyes on them. You know, I don't have any ability to help mitigate those factors that were causing a kid to, to make a poor decision. You know, even if I can get them into the crisis walk-in unit, they're only gonna be there five days, okay? Let's say they really need more help. We can kick them up to another higher level of care. 98% of the time I'd say, they're not going to clear the threshold to stay in that care unit for more than two weeks. So like any of our systems really can only create a two week to three week intervention on the most extreme level. And I don't know if we need to hit anything else. Yeah, I just always think it's worth mentioning um, if I'm sitting in the audience and I hear the words threat assessment, I might be conjuring up in my mind something that's a very big event. That's not always the case. What we found and what we ascribe to is the fact that the bar is very low. If staff or administration or police think something is wrong, we can engage a student into this process, this non-punitive forward thinking and uh, community-based process. So I think that's always worth mentioning. The bar is very low. And that's why it's a successful program. We don't wait for something very, very big to happen. We try to also be prevention focused in our efforts. So these pathways that you see pointing to the right, it's interesting just to mention that they're concurrent. They can run concurrently throughout the course of an event, but they don't depend upon one another. So I don't have to ask Jim at the school district, can I charge this person? We can do that. If there's probable cause to do that, we will do that. We'll communicate about how that looks and how it might impact the overall process and the impact of the children and the family. But if we need to make a decision, we're going to make a decision. Similarly so, if Ed has something that he's working on, he doesn't inform us about how we're going to conduct our business. Yeah, a little bit. On the mental health side, one of the things I want to emphasize here is oftentimes on, you know, we, we assess, but then treatment. The minute I bring up the word treatment, that conjures up one flew over the cuckoo's nest or, or what have you. And that's not always what it looks like. Just like there's a, uh, we can all be operating independently here at various levels of intensity uh, with a student or a community member, treatment is, is the same way. Treatment could be a very high level, state hospital-esque type of intervention uh, down to something that's more of an outpatient um, intervention. In fact, the bulk of the work we're doing is outpatient type interventions, whether that be in the school with our school-based providers or in uh, a community uh, clinic setting, and that could also be our private providers. We, we do have, you know, here in Montrose and the surrounding areas, we have a wealth of private providers in addition to our community mental health system, and so there's a lot of different types of treatment opportunities that, that uh, enable our students to have intervention on different levels as they, as they need. We're gonna get moving a little bit here. Okay, these numbers are as of uh, fall of uh, 2021, okay, on the side. But since we started this process in 2019, we've done about 475 uh, assessments, uh, suicide risk assessments, or su the now called the Suicide Prevention Protocol. And um, we've done about 249 um, threat assessments, okay? Our data is a little wonky because COVID, right? <laughs> you know, um, numbers went down when everybody went home. You know, uh, so, but in general, you look at that pie chart over there, super technical looking pie chart, like we do about three to one suicide to risk uh, threat assessment, okay? And on both programs, whether we're talking about threat assessment or suicide risk assessment, about one in every three of those goes up to a level two that's, that's dealt with at the community level. Um, the bottom line on this slide, the takeaway I want you to have is, uh, one, what Matt said, the bar is low. I mean, literally, when I talk to staff about it, whenever I get a chance, I say, if you get the heat, like if you are uncertain, if the hair on the back of your neck goes up, or you just are thinking about something after kids leave the classroom, you should refer. Okay? Um, Megan Farley is our threat assessment coordinator, and anytime somebody else says, should I, uh, what do you answer? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> if you're asking, yes. Okay. So same thing for community. If you have a concern, I wonder if I should report this. A hundred percent every time. You know, the uh, worst thing that happens is we talk to kids, the kid, their family, all their teachers, and we make sure they're doing okay. You know, I mean that's 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 the program. Um, I'm going to kind of move through these so we can get to questions here. Um, go ahead and do the bill. I think there's a bill. You know, after the so what of the threat assessment program is. We've been able to reduce how much time to drive school. Like I said, there's still a discipline process, so you still may get expelled for something, but that kid is coming back to school inside of 10 days. They're going into an expulsion program, uh, and we are getting them a pathway back. Most of the time prior to this program, kids were out 365 days, and we were like, have fun for the year, we'll see you when you come back. Um, you have to be, you know, can access your education through this way. Um, but now, you know, kids on day 10 were proud. And, and helping them get to mental health appointments, helping them do their um, uh, community service or what, what have you. Um, and most of them would get back to school within three to six months, okay, to their home school. Um, or sometimes we change schools because it's appropriate. Um, this is a suicide prevention pr protocol. On the level two on this, you know, uh, level two ref referral goes to, um, we work with the, the crook. The crisis, uh, crisis stabilization. Crisis stabilization. I always want to say walk in there. But like the crisis stabilization, you know, they got like three names over there, just saying. So you know. um, uh, but like they, they take those kids in, they do an assessment, they see if they can safety plan at home. And if they don't, they have the ability to keep kids there on facility for you know the, the amount of time, up to five days. Um, our goal, you know, if, if our counselors go through again about a 17 question protocol, and then based on that, they make a referral. And all we gotta do is call the crisis center and say, we have a level two, and they know what that means. Um, the so what on this is, you know, standard process. This is important. It allows us to process safe to tell reports, and that's, that's, a, that's a program that Colorado's got that's, you know, a leader in the nation, it's slick as not. I mean, you put it in on July 3rd, I'm gonna get a text, Matt's gonna get a text, dispatcher's gonna get a text, uh, the sheriff, or whoever, wherever that person lives, it's gonna get given to the law enforcement and they're gonna go out and check on it. So I encourage you to use that system. And we'll say as a community member, if you use it, you don't have to be anonymous. You can put your name in there and we'll reach out. Um, but it is anonymous if you want to, okay? Um, yeah, that's a big one, I think. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. The Oftentimes we, we see the word counselor and we think, well, if you're a counselor, that means you do all of these different things in the mental health world. And there's different type of counselors out there. Sometimes similar training, uh, similar experiences, but not always. And uh, for the longest time, our school counselors have uh, borne the brunt of this level of work in, in the school district on top of <clears throat> also doing the guidance counseling and everything else, I think the uh, the testing and, and what have you that they're that they're tasked with doing, and that, that's all specialty work, including the mental health side of things. And so, what this has enabled them to do is focus on what they're great at, and and really be great at that, and then allow those that have the, the expertise on the mental health side of things focus on uh, the mental health needs of the other students that go through. This process. And we had a lot of counselors, and I'm sure they still do, but giving out their personal numbers and, and trying to support these kids all the time. When we, and now we're bringing a team to the table to help support kids in, uh, who are experiencing suicidal ideation. Next slide. Um, this data drove changes within our system, okay? One of the big things is we brought expulsion back in-house in the district. You know, we were contracting that out. We brought expulsion back in-house um, so that we could better integrate and provide services and get them back to their home schools quicker. Um, it drove the social wellness and engagement program, which allows uh, us to intervene K-12 with kids who are having problems um, staying, keeping it together during the day. You know, so it's a behavior intervention that's available and it has a referral process that allows us to refer uh, to school-based mental health. You know, we're currently in a partnership. Uh, we're 50-50 split on on mental health providers with uh, access health systems, and just like the SROs, they're organized around feeders and our nurses. We have so we got nurse, school-based mental health provider, uh, SRO for every feeder system within the district. And um, the last thing I want to mention, which is what I've got the picture of up there, 
is we uh, opened a new alternative school, Black Canyon High School, which uh, uh, allows for um, a, a, an alternative path to graduation. You know, it, it allows us to be more flexible with a lot of the needs these students or families are experiencing. You know, it's also got a more vocational emphasis, a uh, little lower graduation requirement because it's an alternative education campus. If you're interested in that, I know that our principal, uh, Ms. Chavez, would love to talk to you about it. I'm pretty excited about that program. Um, last thing on this, you know, is it's are they successful? I, yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, interestingly, the summer before we went into this, on the suicide side of the house, we had five young adults uh, commit suicide. And uh, you know, it was rough going into that year. Um, not all school age, okay, but recent graduates. Um, and we've, um, we've luckily not experienced that level of impact in the community uh, since. Uh, I won't say we haven't had any. I think we had our first one this year. Um, and so hopefully that continues on that trend. Um, you know, we're in it together. And, uh, and anytime I know I can call individuals from all of our organizations in town, they will answer uh, to support students and families in crisis. You know, at the end of the day, it's not a magic wand, you know, but um, it is something that's for focus. So let's go to the next slide. You know, this culture of vigilance is that it really equals caring for others, okay? So what makes a high quality learning environment also makes a safe school. Like, and that's noticing when someone is impacted and sharing the concerns. Not only receiving the report, it's caring enough to share that information with someone who can do something about it, okay? Um, I think that second bullet is massive, you know? Matt, one to that. Yeah, so I think Ed probably said it best, is these are our people. Montrose is a unique community, there's no question about that very strong community and we care about each other very much. I think the size of our community allows for some very strong and unique partnerships between agencies that deal with this kind of issue on a daily basis. So it always behooves me to say, reasonable people, if they see something that's unreasonable, should probably call. I think Jim also hit on this earlier. If you have a concern for someone, if you think something might not be quite right, it's always the best frontline intervention that we've got when someone knows someone and sees something out of character. So I think that's what that part of this slide means the most to me. Uh, good, strong community partner relationships and just that frontline intervention because we are also close to one another and it is a type of community that takes care of each other. So we notice when something's not quite right and sometimes we're maybe a little bit bashful or worried about the aftermath that we do make that frontline intervention, but we shouldn't be because the alternative could be much worse. And so trust, we want everybody to know we, we have a system to process these concerns and, and what that system is. Next slide, I think these are all the myriad of ways you can share your concerns. You can reach out direct, directly to our law enforcement partners. You can reach out directly to the Center for Mental Health, Hilltop, Northside Clinic. You know, all these different organizations, the judicial system, all can refer into the program. And then, you know, like I said earlier, Safe to Tell is always an option for anybody, and it's an anonymous reporting system, and it's uh, a, a, you know, a national uh, exemplar uh, for how to share safety concerns. You can also talk directly to your school administrators and your counselors. That works just as well. If you want more reading on it, um, I put it over here. The books are up here at the front. Uh, Mark Fullman uh, just published a book in March of this year uh, called Trigger Points. It's really a layman's approach to threat assessment. It does a really good job of saying how this started out um, within the judicial branch. Um, and, and where it is today. There's two chapters in that book, the only, the most time spent with anybody on the Salem Kaiser model, which we use here for threat assessment, and it's got some good case studies in there um, to, to look at. So I recommend that book to anybody, um, and who knows, maybe that author will swing by and see us at some point. And then our strategic plan has a lot of stuff about this in it, and then those are John Van Drill's book if you really want to get in the nuts and bolts of how uh, the Salem Kaiser model works. At this point, I'd like to invite up um, uh, Chris Lehman, our principal, an elementary principal of ours from Pomona, and Scott Brown, uh, secondary principal for Olathe Middle and High School. And we'll turn over to you if you have any questions. Yeah, what? 
I'll introduce myself first, I guess. So I'm Chris Lehman, uh, proud principal of Pomona Elementary. Um, been there, um, this is my fifth school year at Pomona. And uh, just here to answer any questions for you from the principal perspective, uh, what it looks like at an elementary level, um, and, and how we implement and support our students um, with the threat assessment process and safety protocols that we have. So I'm here to answer questions for you. Uh, I would say, um, before coming to Montrose, I lived in Colorado Springs and was a principal there. And just to have uh, a system in place that's as robust and um, systematic uh, as what we have in Montrose is, is powerful. Um, what I had in Colorado Springs was, it, like you said, it usually fell on the principal to deal with and counselors. And uh, having a community approach uh, to safety is, is it, it's fantastic. Fantastic um, from my point of view, and it's nice to have uh, a community approach that supports our student safety. You know, my name is Scott Brown. I'm the principal of Latham Middle High School. I've been there now. This is my 15th year, 17th year in the district. I can tell you from when I first came into the district, you know, our number one priority is keeping students safe. I consider big trust when you send kids to our school to make sure I send them home to you. Uh, and uh, you know, with that trust, that carries a lot of weight, especially when we first started here 17 years ago. And it all fell on me, you know, in my school. So, you know, now that it's a community approach, it's a team approach, you know, there's a lot more collaboration, a lot more reaching out to other resources. You know, it's been a great tool to really keep everyone safe and then not have it all just fall on you. You know, you, you can bring a lot of people into it. So, you know, it's a thing you guys can bring yeah. Okay, any questions? We'll shut up now. Thanks. You have one? We have a whole six minutes for questions. Yeah. So if you have a hot question, you're going to have to be quick, and I'm going to have to run. Terrific presentation. I think you all are way ahead of the curve. Uh, my question is how does monitoring of social media play into any of this? That's a good question. Um, I, over. You know, there's a lot of vendors out there who want to sell you programs that will monitor for your IP addresses and everything. I'm not um, a big fan of those uh, because even if you read the latest reports from um, from the Uvalde deal, they, they're not foolproof at all. Um, so that's part of that local record review. So like when a school administrator uh, is doing a threat assessment, they are searching the search history on the school issued iPads and that is part of the questions on the protocol. Like, are they participating or seeking to identify with various uh, online groups? So that is a question on the 20 question protocol and something that we do um, with our own social, like with our own uh, programs. Uh, but the hard part about social media is a lot of these kids have Finsta account, like they have fake accounts and so, you know, we're, Interestingly, I'd say about a third of the safety tells that come in are from someone seeing something on social media and submitting it. So that might be a little conservative. Uh, it might be a little higher than that. But well, it seems like almost every event that we've had in the country, there has always been something on social media that was present. Yeah, that's. I don't disagree with you, and that's. I mean, that's my motivation for talking. Right? Like if somebody calls and says, do you want to do an interview? I say yes. Because the issue is, you know, we have to attack the bystander problem. Like people got to report. So if you see something on social media, people got to know we got a system that we're not going <coughs> to stereotype that kid, but we're going to check it out. And so, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, 88% of the time before somebody attacks, somebody knew they were going to attack. And so it's like, that's why we got to talk more to, and share what we're doing because we gotta get folks to report those concerns. Because our best eyes for social media are their friends, their family, you know, if that makes sense. Jim, I'd add to that. Bowman actually speaks to that. Yeah. I think it's in chapter nine of Trigger Points where um, he's not saying that statistically there's a correlation between the advancements in social media and the, the relationship with acts of mass violence, mm -hmm. but he, he's seemingly beckoning researchers out there, pay attention to this and, and do some more research into it, because what we're seeing as communities uh, is in fact what you're saying, 
there, there seems to be some notification occurring via, via some social media platform or uh, a dark channel on the web, something like that, in advance of, there's, of an event. And what, if anything, can be done? What can we learn from that uh, in regards to additional, uh, additional uh, warning signs, if you will, um, for uh, our, our intervention and prevention efforts moving forward? Um, good morning, I'm Joey with Care Kindness. Um, Matt shared that the bar is pretty low. Can you help us understand, one, I want to applaud the collaboration and the transparency. I think it's really important as an organization that works with families in the community, um, us being able to understand what the threat assessment process looks like. Um, I think it's helpful in that shared nomenclature. Um, but Matt shared the bar is really low, so can you help me understand what it looks like from the elementary and high school levels when a student um, either themselves or a peer reports bullying? So from the elementary level, like, Jim worked hard on me to help me understand the bar is low, right Jim? <laughs> <laughs> we got it. I got it. <laughs> so it really, any, any type of threat of a student, saying something like, if they're mad, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna hurt you. Um, if it's a direct threat to another student or a group of students, threat assessment, okay? And we have, a, we have a, the tool set up in a way where we determine if that's a reactive or um, if it's reactive or it's a deeper threat, how we move forward with it. At the elementary level, 90% of the time it's reactive, but it gives us an opportunity uh, to reteach that student. Uh, behavior is um, just like any academic um, setting. What we want to teach them what they don't know with behavior. You know what? That's not an appropriate way to respond to respond to someone when you're angry. Here's how. Here's how you communicate your frustration. So we approach it as a teaching opportunity, uh, but we also have that on record. And if it becomes a, um, if it happens again, and we start having trends, we put in different. Uh, um, interventions to support that student. So it starts as easy as just a, a direct threat. You know, um, first and second graders, getting in line is a big issue. Who's in the front of the line? It can turn into a pushing situation and all of a sudden a student will react and say something inappropriate and it might lead to a threat assessment. So the bar's that low. Um, and, uh, but you know, like I said, at the elementary level, most of those are taken care of at the school level. Rarely they make it to a um, level two um, unless they're just repeated aggression. I'm sorry, but we have to close because we have two minutes and Kathy wants, so first of all, can we thank all of these people for coming <laughs>